Good morning, good afternoon, colleagues and friends. Thank you for joining us for the first in the series of the GBV Disruptor Conversations as part of UNFPA's global commemoration of the 16 days of activism to end gender-based violence. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's session, Ms. Melissa Noel. Melissa is no stranger to UNFPA, having hosted events for us in the past. She's an award-winning international journalist, as well as a host and media entrepreneur. Currently, Melissa is a news and politics editor at Essence.com, and she's an experienced travel reporter and Caribbean expert. Among her credits, uh, Melissa is a Pulitzer Center grantee and an FL Payne reporting fellow for foreign correspondents in Africa. She's a proud Guyanese, not to the Caribbean, Guyanese American, with over a decade of reporting and production experience. And so I'd now like to turn you over into the capable hands of Melissa to guide us through today's discussion. Melissa, over to you. Don, thank you so very much for that wonderful introduction. And as you said, I am no stranger to UNFPA. And so I'm grateful to um, everyone, to you and the team there for uh, having me join you all again this year. And as we know, every year UNFPA partners with several sister agencies to recognize 16 days of activism at both the country and regional level. And for the past two years, the Gender and Human Rights Branch has worked to amplify it at the global level. And we've also uh, taken a focus to the Arts and Culture Lounge as a way to demonstrate how the arts can remedy inequities, reflect intersectional voices and influence change from the bottom up. And this event, which kicks off the observance of the 16 days is uh, we're under the theme Artivism for Gender Equality, Disrupting Violence Against Women and Girls. So here we're combining various artistic disciplines, including the visual arts, written word, illustration, makeup, uh, with artists um, and their activism. So we can actually have an open dialogue. This is going to be a, a conversation, right? Not just me firing off questions, but a real conversation about artivism, which is the intersection of art and activism and taking artistic expressions and turning them into action. And you're gonna hear from our esteemed panelists who are doing exactly that in their daily work. Um, it's also about raising awareness uh, to challenge and change norms as such as social and gender norms. And I wanna just point out a couple of things about this event in particular, because we wanna do a couple of things with this event. Um, so of course, this is taking place within the context of the UNFPA's Arts and Culture Lounge. And this is a space where we are bringing, we bring diverse voices of UNFPA together to display the power of the arts, right? To celebrate diversity and to communicate these mandates in a way that can actually enact change. Um, also, we want to demonstrate the linkages between the worlds of art and activism, uh, bring together the expertise of these artists and also their artistic expression. And we also want to showcase their work. They are doing fantastic work and the world needs to know about it, um, not only uh, for the intersections that they are creating, but for the change that they are enacting by using their voices and their arts. So uh, first up, we will have a video message from the chief of the Gender and Human Rights Branch branch who was not able to join us uh, this morning, but certainly put together a video message to welcome us um, to this event and set the tone for what this conversation will certainly highlight throughout. Good morning, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here with all of you today. The arts are one of the most powerful ways to build bridges among people from all over the world. And art is a universal element in all cultures. Therefore, we have chosen to combine art and activism as part of commemorating this year's 16 days theme, activists to end violence against women and girls. For UNFPA, culture matters. UNFPA has had a long legacy of engaging cultural agents and culturally sensitive approaches in changing behaviors and attitudes towards achieving our mandate. 
And we have seen some gains toward the UNFPS3 transformative result to be achieved by 2030 to prevent maternal deaths, to end a met need for family planning, and to end gender-based violence and harmful practices. For instance, in last year alone, through UNFPA work, 12 million pregnancies and 39,000 maternal deaths were averted. And essential services were provided to 2.3 million survivors of gender-based violence and 1.9 million survivors of female genital mutilation. Since 2000, we have seen a 25% decline in the prevalence of female genital mutilation, representing a faster rate of reduction ever seen. And 25 million child marriage were averted in the past decade thanks to accelerated progress in eliminating the practice. So this is possible, this is feasible, and we can do it. Still, the level of progress has been uneven across the three transformative results, you know, depending on the country, the region. So what we need to do is really to dramatically accelerate investment and action to meet the 2030 target. This means entry into creative industries and new space and partnership with artists and journalists who can communicate about sexual and reproductive health and rights in ways that can make it more understandable, memorable, culturally relevant, and actionable. So we want to change the minds of people. We want to change the hearts of people altogether. This is why this event is so important today. We are today are partnering with change makers to show how through the arts, music, painting, makeup, and storytelling, we create a dialogue with communities and open up discussions about possibilities and solutions to make the lives of women and girls safer, healthier, and more prosperous. We know we still have a long way to go to making the transformative result of zero gender-based violence and harmful practices a reality. But we have witnessed how solidarity and partnership has propelled us forward. During these 16 days of activism, the world attention is drawn to efforts to end violence against women and girls. However, for UNFPA, our effort to disrupt the cycle and end violence is 365 days. We invite you to join us in disrupting violence in all the space you occupy from 16 to 365 days. We look forward to working with all of you to advance the right to sexual and reproductive health, women's empowerment, gender equality, and make zero, zero gender-based violence a reality. I thank you. We give our thanks to the chief of gender, the chief of the gender and human rights branch, Nafisito Dio, for that, uh, for setting the tone for this conversation. And I think one thing I want to point out from those remarks is uh, using art, right? Whether we talk, we so we talked about a little bit whether it is paintings, illustrations, makeup, visuals, spoken word. Um, to change, as she said, the hearts and the minds of people around the world when it comes to creating a safer environment for women and girls. Uh, so next up, we have another video, um, which is the UNFPA a, a GBV signature uh, video on gender-based violence. And this is being aired for the first time in this event, and it will continue to be used as a part of UNFPA's advocacy on ending violence against women. So again, that's the UNFPA gender-based violence signature video airing for the first time today. We overcome. Again and again, we prevail. After surrendering our vulnerability, our trust, our love, and having it bruised, we carry on. Like a roaring fire, we dance. After being neglected, forgotten, overlooked, seemingly invisible. 
We stand tall, like a flowing river. We keep going. After injustice, beatings, oppression, bleeding, we overcome. Like a rushing wind, we break through. And as we soar to our full potential, others join us, bringing dignity, breaking boundaries, inspiring a new way. A wave of hope that triumphs again and again to greatness. greatness. A really powerful way to start before we kick it into our conversation here with our panelists. Every woman deserves to live without fear, without abuse, without violence. Um, and I think something that stuck out to me there also is she said, we shall overcome, but can't overcome without support. And so today we have panelists who are doing their parts through uh, with the use of art uh, to uh, spread that message, to be a voice, to lend their voices to change and to end gender-based violence. So I'd now like to take the opportunity to introduce our esteemed panelists and art artists, uh, starting first with Shadu Masaida, who is an author, philanthropist, and champion of marginalized women and youth uh, to ensure that no one is left behind. Shadu is also a South African public speaker who uses her voice as a pageant winner to advocate for universal access to healthcare, especially for women, uh, especially for mental health for women, girls, and youth. She believes that all will have a role to play in providing opportunities to young women and girls in order to achieve their full potential. And as a UNFPA regional champion for East and Southern Africa, Shadu will serve as a regional voice and advocate for universal access to sexual and reproductive health in the region. She'll also position mental health, gender-based violence, and the upholdings of the rights of women and children as part of UNFPA's transformative results and contributions to the Africa Agenda 2063 and Sustainable Development Goals. And as I understand, Shadu, this is your first official event with UNFPA. So we welcome you and we thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. You're welcome. Uh, next, we have Nicholas Smith, who is an artist, illustrator, and committed activist with works that discuss racial divides and gender inequality. Nicholas is focused on creating art that speaks directly to social justice issues and that inspires meaningful conversations. And I am really looking forward to the conversations that we'll all be having throughout the morning. So thank you so much, Nicholas Smith, for joining us. Hello, hello, thank you for having me. For sure. Next, we have Rand Jarala, born and raised in Palestine. Rand is an activist who uses makeup to tell stories about human rights and mental health. Rand has pre previously partnered with the UN Women and Global with UN Women and Global Citizen, aiming to break down stereotypes about women and girls and to create a safer space. And I think that it is so um, interesting, and I cannot wait to hear how you're using makeup to do that. And, uh, and it's something so accessible and so many people tune into. And it's all about, I think, you know, reaching people where they are. And that's what all of you have been doing. And we thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful to be here. And last but certainly not least, we have Sarah Little, who is a journalist and entrepreneur. She founded the monthly podcast, More to Her Story, where she interviews thought leaders to discuss the complex issues faced by women and girls around the world. A passionate storyteller, Sarah works towards global gender equity. Sarah Little, welcome. Thank you, really excited to be here. So I'm going to just get right into this conversation, and um, I want to acknowledge the audience. I know we have people joining us from all corners of the world, so whether it's morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are tuning in uh, to this conversation from, we welcome you and we thank you for taking some time out of your day for this important discussion. And we're going to get right into the conversation now, and I'm going to start off with a question for Shadu, uh, which is about specifically UNFPA's mandate 
what is it about that mandate that we, um, what is it about UNFPA's mandate that influenced your decision to partner with the organization? And can you describe what this new role that you have as a, as a champion um, actually entails? Uh, thank you so much and hello everyone. Um, I think partnering, partnering with the UNFPA was something um, that spoke to my heart because, because the goals and the targets of the UNFPA are very close to my heart. I mean, as a little girl growing up um, in Limpopo, I grew up in a very small village and I witnessed firsthand the many struggles faced by women and young people. Um, and uh, growing up and going into different places of the country, you realize that it's not only in my small village, but across Southern Africa and East um, Africa as well. So these challenges growing up include gender-based violence, less um, Lack of access to, to healthcare and resources, um, gender inequality, and lack of reproductive health and rights. I mean, I only found out about it when I was older that these rights actually exist and we can actually speak about them and bring awareness to them. Um, so my work um, since then has been centered around mental health um, and having spoken to the UNFPA and the wonderful team there, um, I realized that mental health and in all the work that I've done, um, I realized that mental health is a crucial part of sexual and reproductive health and plays a significant role um, in individuals, especially women and girls, exercising their human rights. Um, so I'm so honored now to serve as the regional voice and um, um, and play an instrumental role in the advocacy for universal access to sexual and reproductive health, as well as mental health, as well as the mental health of women and girls in East and Southern Africa. Um, so the partnership and everything, how it came together um, is very much aligned to my heart um, to start, um, but also the goals and the targets of the UNFPA very much aligned to how I grew up and, and the change that I want to see in the world in making sure that no one is left behind. Thank you so much for those details there. And I wanted to ask you if you could follow up by telling us a little bit about what this new role you have here with UNFPA will entail. A little more details about that. We'd love to know a little bit more about what you'll be doing as an advocate and some of the work you look forward to um, being a part of. I think most of it is about visibility. Um, most of us, when we don't have information, um, there's no way to make a change in the world. There's no way to contribute um, to, to, to the change that you want to see in your society. So most of it will be awareness, uh, bringing about conversations like this and being part of um, um, talking about the, the, the practical solutions uh, that we can bring about in our society. I was having a conversation the other day um, about how we've been having a lot of conversations, especially about gender-based violence, but it's important that now, especially as the youth um, and especially as women and girls to be involved at the seat at the table in finding practical solutions um, that actually serve us, you know? Um, so most of my work will be about but around awareness, going into different parts and having conversations um, about finding practical solutions and bringing about practical solutions um, to the problems and challenges that women face, especially where their sexual and reproductive health um, is concerned, um, but also um, but also going to the different parts and just understanding what um, the needs um, are. Um, I think the most important thing that I've always wanted is to find solutions, you know, but making sure that the people on the ground are active participants of the change that they want to see, because that's the only way it can be sustainable. Um, so that's just a bit of, of, of what I'll be doing, um, the conversations being part of the practical solutions, uh, but also uh, engaging the youth uh, to be more involved um, and also just to, to, to continue with the UNFPA to, to reach the targets and the goals um, and the mandates that they've set out, but from um, also the work that I do, which is a mental from a mental health um, lens as well. And we appreciate that follow up there, should you and thank you so much for just giving us a little insight about this important role that you now have with UNFPA and some of the things that you'll be doing. And I, I think, again, like one of the things that you I, that you mentioned that I think will be a theme throughout this conversation is meeting people where they are. Um, and having those conversations on the ground with the people that it's affecting so you can create those sustainable solutions. So we thank you for that. And I, it brings me directly into the next question, which goes to Nicholas. Um, I would like to pose this question to you. We, we are talking about uh, this event today, which um, really has several different goals. And I wanna ask you, how do you specifically define what we talked about earlier, which is artivism? And what does that look like uh, to you and specifically in the work that you do day to day in that engagement? 
Yeah, so thank you so much. Um, I, for one, I'm just honored to to be able to be a little part of this conversation. Um, and I feel like so much of what is talked about, um, it does have to do with the way that, um, honestly, that that we're all in this society, that we're all um, asking so many questions about like, why is this not working right? Why, why are, why have I been, you know, sometimes given, you know, these, these promises of, of autonomy and freedom. And I'm not seeing that in real life. And, and what I want to do with my art is really just call out a lot of those like disparities and like really ask those why questions. And so um, I'll, I'll share my screen and I, I just wanted to, talk a little bit about like you know how I kind of craft this this idea of artivism um and so let me just pull this up really quickly sure no problem and we are yeah. excited to just be able to see in real time some of the work that you do and yeah. to kind of create this, this create this engagement with our audience so we appreciate it all right thank you thank you thank you um so like it kind of, for me, it kind of goes back to Nina Simone, who says it's an artist's duty to reflect the times. And like, we look at all these things that are happening in the world and we see everything that's not working right. And, you know, the artist has to kind of hold up a mirror, right? And so what I started doing many, many years ago was just like looking at everything and just like kind of reflecting those things. So um, my art kind of ranges from a lot of topics but um you know i i started off um as as a, a disney imagineer designing theme parks um but realized along the way that i should be doing more i should be doing like you know art that um speaks to really the the deep problems of the world um and so this whole thing really started for me as artist therapy um i was going through a divorce many years ago I wanted to just make art every week to kind of pull myself from that that low place. And I just like whatever was happening in the world, I just started putting it out there and creating what I call Sunday sketches. So every Sunday, just making a new art piece, posting it online and then having this dialogue with the public about, you know, the things that I was seeing and the things that I felt weren't working right, the things that make people laugh, cry it was artist therapy. So just like, you know, honestly, just trying to um, have this, this dialogue about what is happening to us, what, what are we doing to change things? Sometimes it's funny things make people laugh, like the Obama family is the Incredibles, like, just like fun stuff like that. Um, sometimes it's like hopeful things like, you know, um, these young kids that I uh, volunteer with in, in Watts in South Central Los Angeles and like, um, you know, just trying to just trying to show young kids that they have power, that they have what what we call altruism. Like it's not about how fast or how strong you are, but what do you do with the, the power that you have? Like that's what separates the, you know, the superheroes from the supervillains, you know, that type of thing. Um, just trying to empower especially young people um, and kind of show different superheroes that we don't see in textbooks, you know, like Robert Smalls, who literally escaped slavery and became a congressman, like things like that, that like, oh, that should be a statue. Um, trying to make people think a little bit more about things like, um, you know, not wanting anybody to be judged for their outward appearance. Um, it's just it just became really evident that like art can can do that like art can kind of flip the conversation and and help people to think about things in a different way um so i i really enjoyed doing that and i i would just like go home nights and weekends and and just make art like this um and you know um a lot of the a lot of the art that i i make it i really you know, it's personal to me. Um, it, it it's art that I want to I want to ask those why questions. Like, why is it that my great 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 grandparents, you know, were considered less than human when they are, you know, fully human, fully wonderful people? Um, why why do, why are people, especially in America, like you know, offered these these um, 
freedoms, but they're not really, it's not really like lining up with, with the, the promises that are given. Um, this idea of America in general, um, the America that we're promised and the America that we often see, which is um, often scarred and, and almost like struggling to, to find that hope that, that, you know, we're, we're told is, is part of America. Um, so a lot of the art that I do, it, it is like um, really calling out those, those disparities and the, and the, the things that, you know, we, we don't see, but we wish we could see. Um, and then I, I just started looking at a bunch of different things that are going on in the world, um, immigration, um, you know, green energy, mass incarceration, especially um, um, with women who are um, the, the numbers in America um, of incarcerated women is just like, you know, beyond um, endangered animals, mass shooting tragedies, which we see way too much of. Um, community outreach, um, global health, which in the past few years obviously um, has been unbelievably important. Um, global peace, um, just calling out the fact that we don't need any wars. <laughs> um, you know, um, statements that say you know things like this, like our our lives are worth are worth more than your guns. Um, um, when when young children and people all over the, you know, all over the world, honestly, are, are under the threat of, of violence that they should not be, you know, uh, that they should not be under. Um, racial injustice, which is really big for me. Um, just looking at, again, all those, all those moments, especially that have happened in, in, in recent history where, um, you know, People are are people have their their lives stripped away, their their freedom stripped away, um, and people who no longer have a voice. Like I want art to be that voice um, for for those people, um, and so it's it's moments like that where um, you know uh, Michelle Obama shared shared these three pieces of mine um, on social media and everything just kind of blew up from that point and it was just like amazing to see how like you know one image like one image can say so much and I had no idea that my art could could be on that type of platform um but to see that it it happened it was like okay I can I can take just a few hours to create some sort of visual that speaks to something that you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people um, are saying, and a lot of people write me and say, like, I couldn't really express that. I didn't know how to talk about that with my family or talk about that to the world, but I can share this art piece, you know, and and we can talk about these things. Um, and so I was, I was so honored that, you know, recently I was able to partner uh, with the UNFPA and, um, and, you know, they brought men to the table to talk about the issue of female genital mutilation, which I thought was brilliant because that was something where, you know, we could we could talk about that, the fact that it's not just a, a woman's issue. Like this is something that affects everyone. Um, everyone needs to to be at the table to talk about this. And so with this piece, I wanted to kind of um really just show that that essence. Um, that essence um, uh, in especially young women um, that is stripped away in this in this very violent traumatic um, process and and it's so it's something that um, in a lot in a lot of the pieces like I was saying like it started as art as therapy I want I want my art to to really I really want you to like look in into the eyes of the portraits that I make the people that I that I paint and see their struggle and so um when people when people see this young woman like i want i want them to see like her resolve like her you know the the fight that she has the fact that she can take on the world but also um to see that she is she's dealing with you know one of the most traumatic things that any any person can deal with and, and i want to make sure i, I want to interject here really quickly yeah. because i don't want to 
uh, I want to take an opportunity to just highlight a point you made that I think is really important. You know, those photos you were showing just a minute ago, uh, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, mm -hmm. um, uh, Ahmaud Arbery, um, those photos, as you said, were shared by Michelle Obama. Um, I, I can remember those photos literally being used in classrooms by little kids across America for teachers to speak to their students about, you know, uh, racial injustice in, in the United States, uh, to speak to their children in a way that was, as we said, you can meet people where they are. So meeting children where they, um, yeah. in a way that they could understand through illustration. So I just wanted to uh, highlight that because I thought it was really important um, uh, in the way that you're you're using your art as activism to call attention uh, to issues. You also highlighted immigration, um, uh, you know, about our, our things about our planet, uh, women in prison. And I just thought it was just really important to just take a moment to uh, to say how powerful that is and has been and has reached so many people. Um, I, I saw those pictures shared up to maybe last week. Um, and it also was a way from you know a, a way for families to feel um, uh, more dignity and in, instead of uh, you know maybe pictures being shown of of loved ones in um, in their final moments you know these beautiful portraits are a way to celebrate the lives that they have had um, as well as our children we've seen so many uh, uh, mass shootings taking place um, as well and so to uh, to show. Uh, people in this way, you can uh, really, as you said, you want people to feel it. And I can tell you that uh, we certainly um, can feel uh, feel uh, messages and 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 also kind of, uh, as you said, the resolve in this young woman's eyes. Um, it it really feels like they are looking at us. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I just it's for me. It's just part of the the realization that I came to that you know art has this power to change the world and that's why I'm I am now a full-time artist it's what I do every day and I just want to keep really con continuing that message and keep putting art out there that that speaks to people in that way and we thank you so much for all the work that you have done and continue to do and I think um, I want to just mention to our audience, if you have questions for Nicholas or any of our other panelists, please don't hesitate to drop your questions or comments in the chat. You know, the work that um, our panelists are doing is really, really crucial um, and important. And we want to make sure that they, you know, if you have questions for them, we, we uh, you know, try to get to as many as possible, but to also um, just show them some love for the important work that they are doing. And so I'd like to pose this same question to the rest of our panelists, Sarah, Rand, and Shadu. From your perspective um, or area of work, how would you define artivism? We are getting some amazing examples and um, certainly would like to follow up. So I will, um, I'll go to you, Sarah, next. Hi, um, thanks everybody, uh, and I'm really honored to be here. I would um, describe artivism for me as the merging of art and justice. Um, I really love the Nina Simone quote that Nicholas just shared. As an artist, you know, your work should reflect the times. And I think that today, you know, what we're witnessing around the world is a global epidemic of gender-based violence. I mean, there's an entire country denying girls the right to go to school. Um, in Iran, women and girls are protesting for their basic human rights. So that's what, I, for me, I try to help people understand um, through my journalism, through the platform that I started for young women and girls who are living through conflict, through war, um, oppression, um, to share their stories, and through the podcast that I host um, just to highlight the issues that women and girls are facing globally. Um, and also, as Nicholas said, you know, art can really lift the conversation. So it speaks to people in ways that regular discourse often can't. And I think right now that many young people are kind of tired of the same talking points and they, they want to see something different. They want to see something that speaks directly to these, these issues, but in more versatile and creative ways. So um, that's what I try to do uh, through, you know, my spoken word and other forms of art uh, relating to gender-based violence and advocating for women and girls' rights around the world. Thank you so much for that. Um, and I, I just, I think, especially with what you're doing with the, the podcast and just your interviews, um, I think is really, really critical and crucial that we hear and reach, as we keep saying, reaching people in different ways. We know how many people take the time and listen to podcasts and engage in that way and get to hear directly from the people that are trying to instrument change or to just kind of get that information as we also discussed um, that they need in order to even 
try to go about making change because you have to be informed first. So they're informing your, their, themselves and thank you for your work uh, so much on that. So next I wanna uh, go to uh, uh, Rand Jarala to uh, answer the question, how do you define um, artivism? Thank you so much, Melissa. Yeah, I mean, I would personally define artivism as varying forms of self-expression targeted towards a cause for any length of time. So it can be any form of art, could be visual, spoken, any kind of thing. But as everyone else said, it's targeted towards an actual cause and it can be for any length of time. And we thank you so much uh, for your response to that. And um, I just, I'm seeing, I'm hearing a couple of recurring themes here and I, we just really appreciate um, our uh, panelists were just sharing how their how their art and no matter in which ways they may do it um, is impacting change. And I I'm really interested to we're going to get to a question for you specifically on on makeup a little later. I want to save that, but um, certainly grateful uh, for you to that. And Shadu, I know that uh, um, you you're joining us again, and I hope that you can hear me okay. And so the question uh, that we we pose, I you know we posed it first to Nicholas, and now we would like to hear from uh, the rest of the panelists um, is how do you define artivism uh, specifically and then how you engage with it in your day to day? You gave us a little bit of that in the beginning, but we'd like to hear if you have any additional specifics to add. Um, sorry about that. We had a outage. Uh, but for me, artivism is speaking up even when words fail us. I know there's different mediums, but I'm speaking about it from um, what I've seen growing up, you know, especially in the South African context where I found that I found that it was truly through artistic expression that we could truly express ourselves in the midst of oppression. Um, so growing up, there were struggle songs um, that those who came before us would sing uh, during the apartheid era in order to challenge the systems and the social injustice that was taking place at that time. And I find that even though we've moved 25, 27 years on, um, those struggle songs still carry us today and serve as a reminder um, of how they spoke up even when words failed, how they still found ways to express themselves, um, even though um, even when their words weren't being heard. And it was through music and it was almost transcendent of language barriers in a country where there are 12 languages. So even through my work, um, I wrote a children's book and I worked with, uh, in, with an illustrator and also a child psychologist. It comes in six different languages, but it was so important to find the different ways ways and reaching children where they are and not where we want them to be. So trying to explain to a six-year-old where bullying is um, or what anxiety is, is, a, is very, very difficult. But when I'd ask them, what have you learned from this book? They would say, no, she looks sad here. And then they make the connection from sadness to happiness and happiness to sadness. Um, and it's so important to reach people in different ways, um, especially when we speak about such serious topics and, and trying to make change. Um, it's important to, 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 to speak to the heart of something that was mentioned today um, and also to just um, express ourselves in different ways and just meet people where they are um, in different ways and I found that in my work as a mental health advocate and also um, in, in, in activism as well um, to see how these different forms and it's so important for us to tap into each one of them especially um, like I said in our context as well um, and the amazing work that Nicholas is doing and every single panelist on here um, it's just incredible how um, activism has has um, artivism has always been there, um, and yeah, that's that's how I, I I view artivism or define it. And we are hearing so many different um, intersections of how you are utilizing artivism in your day to day lives, in your work, um, and to impact change uh, with so many different people. And we just, again, just want to say thank you for that and just sharing how it's not, you know, it's not just a word we're throwing around. This is seriously, you know, the intersection of art and activism. And we're seeing how this manifests in the work that you do. And so I think that is a perfect segue into our next question, which goes to uh, Rand. Uh, because specifically you are using something really unique uh, for your um, for your artivism, which is makeup. So I'd like to know what why did you choose makeup as a tool for your artivism? And what is it about the medium of makeup that empowers you to influence change? I found this to be really particularly interesting. 
Thank you so much, Melissa. And I would love to share my story with you to give you some perspective about my choice of artistic medium. As you mentioned in the beginning, I was born and raised in a country of conflict, Palestine. And for most of my life, I've seen nothing but that. So for me, art and creativity have always been my way of coping with reality. And even though the tools have changed over time, the passion is still the same. And I've always loved makeup, but being a feminist and confessing my love for makeup has left many people confused. They even questioned my feminism. So as one would do, I decided to keep my love for it a secret. But then over the years, I couldn't hold it in anymore. So I decided to research this assumption. Is makeup sexist? And it turns out that the materials, the products, and the actual ingredients are not inherently sexist or feminist. The social construct, however, the gendering and the branding of the beauty industry is what's sexist. The way that we subconsciously tell any makeup wearer that they are imperfect or they need to attain a certain scale of beauty is what's misogynist. So if you really think about it, makeup can be used as a form of art. So with that discovery, I decided to start my own movement, Trendistic, which is a combination of friend and artistic to discuss human rights, women's rights, uh, mental health, and other issues that I'm passionate about. And the best way that I found to reach a global audience for free has been the internet and social media. So for the time being, I publish my work on my website and on my social media. Now, I know I've spoken a lot about my work and since it's extremely visual, I would love to show you what I mean. So in collaboration with UNDP and Arab Development Portal in 2018, I produced this piece, uh, which talks about SDG number five on gender equality. And the topic is female genital mutilation. And I will put this out there. It is pretty bloody. So viewer discretion is advised. Uh, can we please play the video? Yeah, the statistics on FGM is truly heartbreaking. Staggering. Um, yeah. Uh, in 2016, I collaborated with UNFPA under a campaign called Seven Days of Makeup to raise awareness of, of the need of women and girls to access sexual and reproductive health services during conflicts, natural disasters, and international emergencies. So if we can show on screen, um, I've created a few makeup pieces um, that talk about that. So um, there's one on flood. So this one is about flood. The next one is on drought. And while that's taking a moment there to just come on the screen, we just, um, you know, those statistics that I was saying were staggering there to just know that, uh, you know, it, it makes it real, right? You can, sometimes you talk about it, you may hear it in passing, but to just see it on screen like that and kind of in your face um, is, is, a, is also a way, but not, it's also a way that makes people pay attention to that. So tell us what we're looking at here. So this one is about drought and it was part of the seven days of makeup campaign to raise awareness as I said, of the needs for women uh, and girls to access sexual and reproductive health and rights services. Um, I can also show you the other ones. There are seven images in total. So the next one would be on um, earthquakes. Uh, 
And the next one is on war. And what a striking way to use makeup to really make people pay attention. That that uh, previous photo of drought and hurricanes, it's just, you know, the cracked skin there for drought and making you think about, yeah, dr you know, that that dryness that that comes from that and how that can is affecting that person's skin in that way, but how it affects people in different ways. And this one, uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about this one. So this one is on war. And then the next one is on child marriage. And the next one is on gender-based violence. So this next one is on gender-based violence. And as we wait for that to come up there, of course, this is our focus today. And so we wanted to just take a moment to acknowledge this one. Yeah. And then the last one is on safe birth. And this one took about seven hours to create because it was on the side of my face. Um, yeah, and then another piece that I love, which was exhibited at the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration and the Platform for Action in Geneva is uh, this one on sexism. Um, yeah, and it symbolizes how women are often treated as accessories at the workplace, social gatherings, or at home. Uh, mental health is also an important area that I love to cover through my work. And this next piece um, is uh, talks about eating disorders, which mm -hmm. affects over 70 million people around the world. And are, unfortunately, it's still on the rise. So as I was saying, there are so many reasons why I decided to use makeup and art to raise awareness. But one other reason that I haven't mentioned before is language. When I first started attending conferences, uh, going to meetings, I realized that there were so many words that if I used outside of that context, people would look at me weird. Like, what are the SDGs? What is FGM? And what the hell is ICPD? So I felt like all that incredible work being done within the limits of the conferences wasn't reaching the public, uh, especially those who are not specialized in these issues. And these issues are important to each and every one of us. We need to know what is happening in the world which is why I decided to use art. I recognize that makeup is an unusual choice when it comes to artivism. And that's exactly why I chose it for the juxtaposition. Because for me, I believe that art is a global language that transcends all boundaries. It truly really has the power to change the world. And what a great way to kind of wrap up there that art literally transcends all barriers, no matter what language you speak or where you come from, we can all certainly uh, feel the power in those pictures, um, how striking they were and can get the message from them. So we thank you for your work and for sharing those powerful images with us, what inspired you to do the work that you are doing and uh, most definitely um, keep doing that work. It is so necessary. Um, and we thank you seriously for uh, just taking some time to just share with us um, those messages there. And so that brings me into the next question, which goes to Shadu, uh, which has to do with your work specifically as an advocate for mental health and standing up against gender based violence. How do you see art um, play a therapeutic role um, in this process? Um, working as a mental health advocate, um, I got to realize that sometimes, um, in many respects, the words used to describe what women are going through may fail us. Um, and that's because women often bear, bear the brunt of societal needs on their shoulders and confirm, conform to societal structures that tells us, um, or that tell us what it means to be a good woman. Even at, even at our own detriment, especially where culture is involved, um, especially that in the African context. Um, art is, is very therapeutic and many professionals that I've worked with in the mental health space attest to that um, and has a, has a plethora of mediums that speak volumes even when words fail. Uh, most of the time, it is only through visual expression, as you saw now with uh, Ryan's work. Um, I mean, some of those images, I think we only get the gravity of... Um, 
what uh, women and, and young girls and people go through uh, in different spaces, especially where gender-based violence is concerned. I think only once we see the images and the visuals do we then see how big the problem is. Um, I was reading up on an artist called Linde Gagrapi, who um, is um, an artivist herself, and she was encouraging victims to use their art in order to express their pain and to, to rid themselves of the stigma and shame around these issues. And art serves as an awareness tool and a therapeutic tool for those living with mental illnesses, but also victims of GBV. So I think um, based on everything that we've been speaking about today and the different visuals that we've seen, um, it's clear to see how art can be therapeutic, yes, but it can also serve as an awareness tool for us to actually see what is happening around us. I mean, the, the paintings that Nicholas did, um, when you saw them, when most people saw them, um, they, they got chills down their spine. And now uh, looking at Rand's work of GBV, war, um, even FGM, um, and even that video that you showed us in, in the beginning, it's only when we see that uh, we know where to read about it. But once we see the, the artistic expression of it and the visual expression of it, um, or even some of the words that were shown in the video, um, do we then see the gravity of it? So it can be therapeutic, yes, but also serves as an awareness tool. And I've seen that in my work, I've I've used art as therapy as well. Um, and it's helped me a great deal. Sometimes when you're struggling with anxiety, um, it sounds weird, but it's literally taking a coloring book and just coloring in and you feel so much better at something as simple as that. It does not have to be, you know, as grand and and, and um, um, intricate as that, but it's through artivism um, and art that we find therapy, but also bring awareness to the issues such as uh, gender-based violence that, um, women and young girls face. Thank you so much for that, Shadu. And I just wanted to echo a point you just made, which is uh, we, we've been talking a lot about how art is able to reach people in different ways. And um, something that came to mind is that art makes it tangible for um, so many people when they, they're seeing, uh, whether it's the makeup and, and, and seeing how that, that impact can, can take shape or take hold, it's illustration. Um, it is, you know, having those conversations, art makes it tangible, makes it real for so many people to say, wow, this is how this impact is taking place, is impacting my neighbor, is impacting someone, you know, who may be a world away, but can certainly relate to what, um, you know, is taking place. And so, um, Nicholas, I'd like to pose the next question to you, but uh, before um, we get to that next question. We've been using a lot of, um, of acronyms here, and I just want to take a second to thank Dawn for just putting those in the chat. SDG, Sustainable Development Goals. Um, also FGM, Female Genital Mutilation, and also GBV, Gender-Based Violence. So we are, uh, you know, using those um, acronyms there to refer uh, to these specific things uh, throughout the conversation. And you'll hear those come up a lot and they are really, really important. So I just wanted to point those out. And also, if you do have questions for our panelists, you know, we don't want you to forget. So please uh, don't be afraid to drop those in the chat so we can get to it uh, towards the end of the conversation. Um, we've gotten so, um, so many great, uh, so much great insight that we wanna be sure that if you have questions that those things are answered. So Nicholas, uh, the next question is to you. Um, you get to create art and influence change throughout that art alongside your life partner. How does that influence your work? Um, and what role does that relationship play in actually inspiring your artwork? Um, it's, it's phenomenal. Um, <clears throat> so my, my wife, Vanessa is, <laughs> She's like, I, I say like, she's, she's my art director. She's my um, manager. She's like the lawyer and all of these things that like a million different things in one. Um, and I, I would say like there, none of this that I do would be possible without her. And she has, she had like the vision for everything that I am doing now. When I was like working at Disney, when I was, doing construction documents every day and in a job that I didn't realize at the time, but like it, it was, it was something that I couldn't, there's no way I could continue doing that for the rest of my career. Um, but she had the vision for like, oh, you should, you should basically quit your job and start, start focusing on these, these other issues. And so, 
um I'm always thankful for for the vision she had she she kind of like helped make all of this a reality in terms of like being a professional artist um at a time when I I didn't really understand like what it even meant to be a professional artist um and she just kind of like saw that potential that I that everything could be and um it, there's just something about like also just having the the perspective of a woman on on so many things that I just my art wouldn't be as as deep or layered in in so many ways without like her she's literally an art director like when I'm I'm making my sketches every Sunday she's literally like always there like like asking like well why is this why'd you do it like this like why why can't you why don't you like look at it this way and things that I just don't even think about and so I just I just love that and then also like we have um you know we have a, a two-year-old now and so every day it's just like we're we're just like this little unit just like um it's like the work-life balance of of you know raising a child but also like traveling the world and and speaking on on artivism and, and doing all these things um and she also reminds me to like you know unplug and and like not be so focused on work every second of the day um so it's just I, it's just a, a a beautiful balance i think and i'm very very grateful that you know i could have her to to you know be able to, to support me in that way and we thank you for sharing such that those wonderful tidbits about your partner and just how, you know, that, that as you said, that woman's touch there uh, yeah. to the work that you are doing and just having that person to bounce things off of creates such a great balance. So thank you so much for that. And we are um we we are so appreciative of you just uh, for all of our panelists for just sharing such an insight into their work, their personal lives, and into how they are literally creating change, whether with that's this with a stroke of a makeup brush, brush the paintbrush, uh, or using their microphones in many different ways to amplify these messages. Um, as we observe the uh, as we observe uh, this event and the sixteen days, both uh, you know at the the local level and um, um, internationally. So next question goes to uh, to Rand. Uh, I'd like to know, uh, amidst all of the issues facing women and girls today, what is it that keeps you committed to your work and resilient against any pushback that you may receive? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. And I resonate so much with what Nicholas was saying, specifically the last part, which is Honestly, I believe that self-compassion and rest um, are important. Understanding that some days require us to take a step, a step back and reassess is vital in my opinion, because especially in today's world where um, artists are expected to produce works of art on a daily basis to stay relevant, I think that is both unrealistic and consumeristic in nature. So resting, re-evaluating, and being very self-compassionate in that process is important for me to keep going with my work. And as we, I, balance is key, right? And I thank you for sharing how uh, things keep, what keeps you going, what keeps you motivated, because of course, um, uh, artivism, you are, it's at the intersection of art and activism. And so, you know, one thing there is the, um, that you can get burnt out um, and there, so that that need for balance is certainly necessary so that you can keep uh, pouring into others and to spreading these uh, messages of positive impact um, as you go along in your journey. So yes, balance, rest, um, and so much more. I think our panelists are certainly not only uh, sharing their art with us, but also giving us tips for just everyday life management that we can um, all uh, use. But I certainly want to uh, just acknowledge that you sharing those personal tidbits with us. And um, Sarah, I'd like to specifically uh, talk to you about your uh, podcast and why you uh, chose that medium and how do you see the benefits of hosting a podcast as a way to enact change as compared to visual forms of art 
And how do you maximize the power of storytelling in those conversations? So yes, using a podcast, which um, you know I can certainly relate to on the journalism end, but why that form? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the reason I decided to start a podcast was to hear from experts and world leaders and young people on how to advance gender equity, but also to complement the, the platform that I run called More to Her Story that amplifies, um, as we've been talking about, the stories of young women who are living in conflict zones who have been marginalized. Um, and the purpose of more to her story as both a platform and a podcast is to hear directly from young women instead of just hearing about them. We hear a lot of statistics thrown around about gender equity, about women's rights, all of which are important, but I think it's actually more important and in some ways more impactful um, to hear from young women themselves about the issues that they're facing and to have a safe space to do that because unfortunately there's very few of those. Um, and I think one of the biggest benefits of hosting a podcast is that along with you know hearing from so many young women uh, about advancing gender equity I get to interview people who have a lot of influence um, my most recent guest was Nicholas Kristoff I'm sure you're familiar um, he's from the New York Times and he's he was one of the pioneers of breaking the taboo uh, around talking about and writing about gender-based violence on the front page of the biggest newspaper in the world. So having someone of Nick's caliber talking about violence against women and girls is you know, so important because it shows young boys and men that it's okay and actually necessary to talk about these things and that all of these issues that we're collectively facing as a world are fundamentally in intertwined. Um, and so the opportunity to amplify these incredibly influential voices um, to people who might otherwise never get the chance to hear them has been a huge benefit of hosting the podcast. Um, and then lastly, to your question about how to maximize the power of storytelling um, through conversations, whether on a podcast or not, um, I would say, don't be afraid to go deep in your conversations. Um, it's easy uh, to stay and a lot less scary to stay on the surface. Um, but you probably won't get to the core of what you want to know and what you're talking about. So um, we're living in an extremely you know, noisy time. There's a lot of, a lot of white noise all around us and going deep, I think is really the only way to cut through that noise um, and give us the power to have much more meaningful and purpose-driven conversations and um, ultimately affect real change. So I have a follow-up question for you there. You know, yeah. you gave us some great insight on to, as to why the podcast and being able to speak directly to people and hear those stories and connect directly with them. But if you could choose another powerful way to share stories about ending violence against women and girls, what type of art would you create? Yeah, good question. Um, so for me, music has always been a very powerful force for change. Um, and I've always loved words and poetry since I was a little girl. And so when I discovered that I could combine the two, I was completely mind blown. <laughs> um, and so I've been over the past couple of years actually writing a lot of spoken word poetry and rap. Um, and I, I actually have something prepared for you guys today. Uh, you know, graciously, you know, um, allow me to share this. So, and just for context, the UN released a report in September saying that at the current rate of progress, it could take 300 years to achieve gender equity. Uh, from Afghanistan to Iran to the United States, women and girls everywhere right now are fighting for their basic rights. So that's what this uh, rap is about. And yeah, hope you guys enjoy it. <laughs> Worth the way but there are girls who live in fear their fate is freedom worth the wait I get on my knees and I pray asking God not to delay a good thing my integrity is never a stake but we've reached a point where there's lives at stake they say be patient it's worth the wait but there are girls who live in fear their fate is freedom worth the wait what are you dying to take? Trying to go off the grid, but it's hard. I see girls my age getting barred. They say shoot for the hoop, keep away from the stars. Forget education, cause this world is ours. Girls getting pregnant at 10. Their value reduced to what they give men. Regressing to way back when. Regressing to way back when. Tell me that this is a lie. Tell me you aim for the sky. They say the definition of failure. 
as if you didn't try so look i'm trying i just want to see girls around the world flying instead of their hopes and dreams dying there are things that money just cannot buy and i hear the screams and the battle cries of afghan girls on the front lines iranian girls in disguise can't be seen by men's eyes why why is this still a fight i sit in my bed and i'll write i swear i could do this all night don't have to cut me open with a knife i stay in the home because i'm worried about my mom's safety i stay here because i'm worried maybe he will kill her every day my brother goes to school but i can't why they say you can't do it like that but who makes the rules that's cap we ask why the world is the way that it is cuz people weren't taught to fight back now nah, this is in poetry this is called rap using my voice to spit all the facts tired of me not in his chat can you be real with me that's all i ask tell me what goes on in your head late at night do you have bad dreams do you ever lose sight do you ever get scared when you do do you fight who are you in the dead of the night this path is lonely i'm not gonna lie that's what they told me man they were right trying to find those who can see the vision when everyone else is losing their sight as for me i write till i bleed pray till i see don't settle for less than i know i could be girls count on me to raise up their scream so i'll be on the front lines until we're free Three hundred years is the estimate um, for the amount of time that it will take uh, for us to reach gender equity. What a staggering and sad statistic there, and what a powerful a message that you brought to us there with that rap. And we just want to thank you, Sarah, for using your voice in that way. You pointed out so many things in that, but a couple of things I was thinking about is like, you know, you were talking about, you know, us regressing to, you know, times in history and then just hearing the, um, hearing the little girl saying, why can't my brother go to school but uh, but I can't why can't I go to school too just just bringing all these things um literally as we said making it tangible hearing from uh young girls and and to the things you pointed out in the song I think really drove home many of the issues that we've talked about today um and I think is a, a really powerful way for you to reach so many people so thank you so much for sharing that with us thanks for letting me and so we just want to keep um, in the interest of time, we are literally are moving along quite well. And I'm really glad about that. We've had so much to share from our panelists. So the fact that we are hitting our marks, I'm really uh, happy about that. But I also uh, want to take the opportunity to um, ask our panelists if uh, to pose one final question to our panelists, I should say. But before I do that, remember our uh, audience, if there are any questions that you have, questions or comments, but certainly questions for our panelists that you have, please do not be afraid to drop those in the chat because we do have some time for questions. And we want to make sure that if you have um, any pressing questions that you'd like to pose to them, that they are able to answer as many as possible before today's session is over. And so I'd like to invite you to please don't be shy, drop those questions in the chat and we will facilitate those. Um, and in the meantime, I'd like to pose a final question to our entire panel. Um, and this question is, if you had to, in 30 seconds, share a campaign slogan that connects your art with UNFPA, what would that slogan be and why? And I think that I'd like to start with Shadu. Um, if I had to share a campaign slogan, that's a difficult one because you want it to be, um, yeah, mine would be the mind is the powerhouse, the tool that can change the lives and the narratives that exist in our society. For any change to come about in our society, we need to empower the mind, especially the minds of women and girls across the world, for them to know they have a choice and a voice. Yeah, that would be my, my slogan. For them to know that they have a choice and a voice, I think that is um, so profound there. And we thank you. What a great um, campaign slogan. So next, I will take it to Nicholas. Um, yeah, so I would say that um, I just want my art to, to really hold up a mirror and reflect the times, reflect what's going on in the world and show people what is happening to real people. Um, affected by very real issues 
And I want to use my art to just really show how we can fix these issues, either by like shaking them and, and waking them up and, you know, making art that, um, you know, might be a little bit more like forceful and eye-opening or art that um, um, really just paints the picture of where we need to go to be a roadmap to get to that, that end result. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Next to uh, Rand, how would you, what would be your uh, campaign slogan? Um, I think it would be something that would kind of summarize everything that we have spoken about on this uh, discussion, but also inspired by the work that I do. And it would be transcending language for women's rights. And you're, you're, uh... We saw through your photos there that your makeup certainly transcends all barriers and, you know, the the power and the gravity at which we are able to see uh, those images, certainly no matter what language you speak or where you come from, you can feel, um, you can certainly feel the gravity of those issues. So we thank you for that. And uh, Sarah certainly um, ask you to add your slogan to the mix here. And what would your 30, if you had 30 seconds, what would that slogan campaign slogan be that connects your art and UNFPA? And we know you have both your podcast and now we know about your, uh, your raps as well. Um, yeah, so on that note, uh, my slogan would be, don't be afraid to raise your voice. Um, as I said before, you know, we're, I think that we're experiencing a global epidemic of gender-based violence and women's voices are being systematically silenced on a global scale. Um, and this requires new levels of courage to raise our voices, to shout from the rooftops, demanding our basic human rights. Um, you know, I'll say it again, there's a whole country denying girls the right to go to school. If that doesn't outrage millions of people, I don't know what will. Um, and if the UN estimates are correct and it takes three centuries to achieve gender equity, that's 12 generations of girls who won't grow up in an equal world. We can't wait that long. And as you pointed out to us, that really staggering uh, statistic that it will likely take, the estimate is you know 300 years to achieve gender equity. So it, it would be something that um, unfortunately by that estimate, we wouldn't see in our lifetime. Um, and so there is certainly work to be done. Um, and I just want to uh, take an opportunity to thank each and every single uh, person who is on the panel this morning for taking the time to share their artivism with us and how they are intersecting art and activism to end gender-based violence again against women and girls. And, and I would just want to take a moment right now to, in, to invite Dawn Minot to do our closing before we um, open up for questions. Thank you, Melissa. And as you said, my name, I realized when I got started this morning, I did not introduce myself. So indeed, my name is Dawn Minot. I am in an advisor, a gender-based violence advisor here at UNFPA in our headquarters. Um, and it really is my pleasure to, um, to give these final um, words on closing out our session today. But first, I must thank you, Melissa, for the way that you ably led us through this conversation and really to make it into a conversation, very engaging. Um, Shudu, Nicholas, Rand, Sarah, um, really thank you for, you know, really just contributing a, in the essence of, of what you do and bringing that to a platform like UNFPA, uh, because we recognize that in order for us to really make GBV um, uh, not in existence by 2030, we do need to have partnerships with, um, you know, culture and change leaders like yourselves. So thank you for accepting our invitation and for being here today. And I, I just really just want to reflect on, on a couple of the words that came out of the slogans that you also creatively put together. And maybe we should be using all of these slogans to create a, a campaign um, for our next 16 days. Um, but I, I heard a resounding um, a focus on voice, on choice. And really, Sarah, thank you for bringing into our conversation this report, like 300 years to achieve gender equity. We cannot wait that long. Um, and certainly it has been you know, long recognized that art um, holds the power, um, not just to, in terms of exposing wounds of conflict or soothing tormented spirits and teaching lessons about 
war and peace. But today we also really got a chance to see that arts is, uh, can be used as a means for advocacy, for healing. Um, and then from each of your presentation, very specific issues that came in in terms of immigration, addressing mass incarceration of women, um, looking at climate, the impact of climate change on animals, on our world as we know it, um, looking at peace, but most importantly on the areas that are so um, intricate to UNFPA's mandate which is around addressing the issues of gender-based violence, of gender inequality, looking at harmful practices such as child marriage and female genital mutilation. And whether that came through in terms of makeup as you did Rand, or in terms of the, the artistic expressions that you showed Nicholas, it really just shows that the power of the art um, to, to have us to really be able to experience um, you know, these issues in ways that are different from the way UNFPA would traditionally and typically speak. Um, we also saw that much of what you do is rooted in culture. And as Nafi said in, in the opening, culture is intricate to the work that UNFPA do. Um, we recognize that cultural activities, you know, really have the potential to connect with people um, in trusted ways that, that really resonate more deeply than traditional public health communication, which is really the, the, the kind of platform that UNFPA would traditionally speak with. But working with artists and journalists like yourselves does give us a place to, to speak from a different perspective and from a different platform. Um, so one of the things I, I do want to emphasize is really how the work of UNFPA is seen, right? We, we, we work in the most sensitive and intimate spheres of human experience or of human existence. We work on issues of sexuality, issues of reproductive health and gender, and forging non-traditional partnerships such as with artivists such as yourselves brings that creative impulse and the power of popular culture to the issue of women's sexual reproductive health and rights. And this is really important at this time because we're looking at that tremendous pushback. And you mentioned this a little bit, Rand, in your interventions just now, like really looking at the tremendous pushback that we're seeing um, both on what we've achieved so far, but also rolling back on some of those rights as well. Um, so to our audience who joined us today, what do you do with the power that you have Art can lift the conversation as we saw today to help us to think in different ways. Art can also be a voice of the voiceless as we heard and also that art transcends borders. So with this, in, this event, our objective was really to motivate you to influence the spaces you occupy, to disrupt the cycle of violence and really to join UNFPA towards achieving zero gender-based violence by 2030. As Nafi said in her opening, it is possible. And that's why we do these kinds of events and use the 16 days to really amplify the work of what UNFPA is doing, not just within 16 days, but 365 days of the year. So in closing, as UNFPA, we know we must address cultural issues to make greater progress. And this is especially important in work to promote gender equality and sexual reproductive health and rights. So again, I really just want to, on behalf of uh, the UNFPA family, to thank these artists and activists and artivists who joined us today for this global movement. And again, to you, Melissa, for walking us through as ably as you did. And for all of our guests who came in, thank you for joining us. And please join us for the upcoming, the upcoming um, Global GBV Disruptor Conversations. You will see that we've placed a link in the chat. So by all means, please go onto that link and register for the upcoming events. We promise that you will be able to, to learn quite a bit, but also be able to contribute to UNFPA making a difference in this area of work. So with that, I just want to once again say thank you for being here. And artists, activists, artivists, thank you for your contributions as well. Thank you, Don.